Gentlemen, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you here uh, to CSIS for, a, for a, uh, one of our Banyan Tree Leadership Forum sessions with the Chairman and President of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, Fred Hochberg. And I'd like to particularly welcome uh, the colleagues from the uh, ASEAN Washington Committee, the Diplomatic Corps, uh, the ambassadors are here and, and welcome. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, Last June, I was, uh, I was in Hanoi, and uh, I got a call from a, an old friend named Kevin Varney, who's the chief of staff of uh, Mr. Hochberg's at, at Exim Bank. And he said, um, any chance we could check in with you? We're, we're in, uh, I'm with the chairman, we're traveling in Asia, we're, we're picking out some major markets for Exim Bank to focus on, and, uh, and would like to just touch base. And I, I said, well, sure, where are you? He said, I, well, I'm in Hanoi, and I said, Great, I'm, I'm right here. So uh, we, we ended up having a, an opportunity to sit down for about an hour um, at the famous um, uh, Metropole Hotel in, uh, in Hanoi. And I got to, to meet uh, the man who is the leader of uh, Exim Bank, and I was really impressed uh, with his vision, uh, with his commitment to develop um, markets in Southeast Asia and globally, of course. He's got a tough job. He's the point man on, the, on President Obama's team for uh, reaching an incredibly uh, ambitious goal, uh, but one that we all, our economic destiny, destiny is, is all tied to. And that is to, um, to try to double U.S. exports uh, over the next five years. And, and this is a man who can, can really probably uh, help us realize that goal. He's the highest ranking, one of the highest ranking business leaders in the Obama administration. He was nominated by the President in April of 2009 and unanimously confirmed by the Senate. Um, he's really a Renaissance uh, man type of leader, uh, a fascinating guy with a, a strong uh, corporate sector background, but has also worked in education. He was the longtime president and chief operating officer of Lilly and Vernon Corporation, uh, and he transformed that from a family-owned, small family-owned uh, mail order company into one of the leading uh, international publicly traded direct marketing corporations. Um, he's also worked in government before. He was the acting administrator of the Small Business Administration, and uh, after that, he, was, he went to the academic sector and was the dean at the New School in New York from 2004 to 2008. Um, performance at Exim Bank has been measurable and very impressive. Uh, under his leadership, the banks recorded a second consecutive record-breaking year, including a, a nearly $25 billion of export financing uh, out the door which supported $35 billion worth of exports and uh, nearly a quarter of a million American jobs and more than, th more than uh, 3,300 American companies. So uh, they're busy over there. Uh, uh, Fred Hochberg is on the road constantly uh, looking for opportunities to develop new markets. I really loved his focus on Southeast Asia and, uh, of course, uh, here at the CSIS Southeast Asia program, we're looking for leaders with vision who understand uh, the importance of America's um, engagement in, in Southeast Asia, and I think Fred Hochberg is one. So please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Hochberg for his presentation. Well, uh, Ernie, thank you. And on the way in, he, Ernie tried to direct me into a panel discussion on the Mexican economy and economic policy and immigration, and I said, I wasn't prepared for that subject. So we kept walking down the hall until we found here. And I'm very happy to see the, our ambassador, the ambassador from Indonesia, who I've had a chance to meet with and have dinner with. And um, I felt like when I met Ernie in the, in the Metropole Bar in Hanoi, it sounded like the start of a movie, but, uh, <laughs> or certainly many movies. Um, but I did meet Ernie on our first, my first trip to Vietnam as chairman. And uh, he was very helpful in, in planning that trip and in executing it. So um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a terrific trip that also included Indonesia. And before I get into my re remarks, I actually want to talk to you a little bit about uh, one of our companies and our clients in Indonesia. And it's a company called Lion Air. And uh, it's uh, Indonesia's first low-cost carrier. 
And to reach more customers and to expand uh, its, its fleet, uh, our bank at Exim Bank, we approved recently a billion dollars to finance Lion Air purchasing 30 uh, 737-900 ERs. Um, and we've already delivered 17 of those. Now, all of you, I can't imagine, everyone in this room has probably flown on a 737. They've been, they've been, they started in 1967. They're uh, 8,800 uh, 737s have been manufactured, more than any other plane, I think, in the history of Boeing. Um, and the 737-900 ER uh, is, um, is the latest model. It's the newest model, the longest range, the most capacity. Uh, of any in that uh, suite of planes. So what was key was who was going to launch this aircraft? Who was going to be the launch customer? And the launch customer is a very critical, uh, particularly in aircraft, but in many products, how you find what company is going to take the risk and help you really get production up. So, and that was Lion Air. And they have so far purchased 178 Boeing 737-900 ERs. So, this was the first time we financed the private sector, a private sector carrier in Indonesia. Uh, it's helping to transform not only that company, but the kind of service they provide throughout Indonesia. And um, I'm very biased. I'm very happy it's, it's a Boeing and it's not somebody else, whoever that may be. Um, and it supports a lot of jobs. It supports thousands and thousands of jobs here in the United States. It supports thousands of jobs in Indonesia. But I tell you that because it's only part of the story. This company was founded only in the year 2000 by two brothers, Kusnan and Rusty Kirana. And I had a chance to uh, meet Rusty when I was in London at the uh, Fonbro Air Show. And the reason Lion Air is particularly of interest to me and why I'm talking about it is because it also follows another business model, and that is Southwest Airlines. And so not only did we export American products and technology, we exported an American business model. And the Southwest business model of a low-cost carrier has actually totally transformed commercial aviation around the world. And in addition to com companies like Lion Air, there is um, Goal in Brazil, Ryanair, EasyJet, and many others, Norwegian Air Shuttle, many, many which are flying Boeing aircraft. So this company, this transaction, is really very much emblematic of, of what we do at the Exxon Bank. Frequently helping startup companies, introducing innovative new products, and helping develop infrastructure in the countries we operate in. And frequently, uh, I know we have friends here from Boeing, frequently we can enter a market through aircraft sales and then open up our portfolio to infrastructure and power projects and a number of other things. And frankly, it's often with large companies like Boeing that can clear the path so that smaller companies and small businesses um, can also build their presence in foreign markets. But let me, let me bring you back to uh, a little bit of our beginnings and then we'll go, go back to Southeast Asia. Exim Bank was formed in 1934 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, uh, in the depths of the Depression. And in fact, I sit at, uh, for those of you who are American taxpayers, I sit at the same desk the first chairman of the bank used, Jesse Jones. So that desk has been serving the bank for 76 years. No new furniture. A little polished now and then, but it's still working. Um, our earliest transactions, back in 1934, I was not there, uh, were roads, uh, routes, construction, and much of that continues today. The very, one of the early ones that you may remember is the Burma Road, 1938, 700 miles long, connecting the interior of China to the outside world. Uh, followed by the Pan American Highway, 1941, 30,000 miles, because it snakes through from North America to South America, and really was the first opening up of a trade route between the United States and South, South America. And the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan post-World War II was largely financed through Exim Bank, and that Marshall Plan was $2 billion. Now, I think $2 billion is a lot of money. $2 billion in 1946 was really a lot of money. And in fact, there's about $128 billion in today's dollars. So a lot has changed in 75 years, but what does remain the same is in 1934 and all those projects I talked about, 
It is about strengthening our economy. It's about creating jobs here through exports and creating economic activity, economic vitality, economic jobs in the countries we're exporting to. So what we've done and what has changed over that time is we're now selling more locomotives, more airplanes, more helicopters, as well as road construction and, and, and some of the traditional things back from 1934. We're building power plants, telecommunication towers, and really helping emerging economies grow and become and build their own infrastructure. And a lot of it also is now medical technology and a lot of satellite sales. We've seen a burst of satellite sales, satellite transactions in the last, in the 18 months that I'm at the bank, there's been a huge uptick in satellite production. Um, as Ernie mentioned, I was in business for 20 years, so um, I look at a year-end, I ran a public company, I look at a year-end with uh, a particularly sharp focus, and Ernie gave you a number of, our, of the details. Yet yeah, we did about $24.5 billion in transactions. We're up 70% from two years ago. Two years ago and for the prior 10 years, we were operating about a 10 to 12, uh, 12 to $14 billion range. We're now in the mid-20s, 25 billion. And this year looks like we'll have another record-setting year. Um, we created just under a quarter of a million U.S. jobs that were created or sustained. And our financing's financed about $33 billion in U.S. exports. One thing I like to add is um, we do this at no cost to the taxpayer. The uh, fees that our customers pay fully pay for our administrative costs. They fully pay for our loan losses. And in fact, since 1992, we have uh, generated in excess of all of our costs $5 billion that we've returned to the American taxpayers as additional deficit reduction through our work. So if any of you are friends with John Boehner, anybody here friends with John Boehner? If any of you are friends with John Boehner or anything else, you know, if you have a moment, a personal moment, you want to share that, I've shared it, but. You know, I always say if people hear things in stereo, it's better than they just hear it in mono. So if you have an opportunity, I wouldn't, that, that'd, be a, that'd be a good message to share. Five billion dollars, one, two, three, five billion dollars. Um, so what we've been trying to do, particularly in this financial crisis, is to ensure that U.S. companies, large and small, have access to capital and have the competitive edge to compete in the global marketplace. And what we're doing now is trying to target a work we can have the most impact. Now, as you all know, the President announced uh, the doubling of exports at the State of the Union address um, in his first State of the Union address in 2010. Uh, he actually announced the National Export Initiative at the XM conference in March of 2010. And the goal to double exports in five years, support more than two million additional American jobs, Actually, personally, I think that's a conservative estimate. I think we can actually, that will support even more jobs than the two million the President is estimating. But what I wanted to do when I got to the bank, uh, and again coming out of the business world, is to do an analysis of where we could have an impact. Um, so what we did is we looked at 180 countries that we operate in, and we said, where can we really have an impact? Where should we focus our activities? Uh, not a surprise which is probably why I'm invited to speak here. Indonesia and Vietnam are two of those countries. And let me tell you why, a little bit why we selected those two, and then I won't leave you in suspense. I'll tell you the other seven. One is a growing GDP. These countries have rapidly growing GDP and a rapidly growing economy that's going to need infrastructure, need infrastructure to keep that economy going. They're going to need both power plants, roads, airports, the entire medical infrastructure, all those things that will help that those economies grow at the rate they've been growing at. And importantly, in these, in these nine countries, our financing makes a difference. Our financing can make the difference for an American product to be sold there, American product to be financed, and in the case of small businesses, to provide the kind of credit insurance to make those happen. So I know you're on the edge of your seat. So the other seven countries are in Southeast Asia, in South Asia also India, um, moving across the globe, Turkey, uh, Nigeria, and South Africa, and then in our own hemisphere, um, Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil. Those are the nine countries we are intensely focused on. Those are the nine countries where we see the greatest opportunity for U.S. exporters, 
and where we see the, their economies growing. Last year, we did $5 billion in those nine countries. We're targeting to do about $9 billion in export sales in those nine countries this coming year. So I, I had a, ambitious goals uh, to visit all nine countries in the first six months of, of 2010. When I arrived in Jakarta, I realized how long it was to get to Jakarta. <laughs> So I had to rein in my plan. So I made it to eight out of nine. I didn't make it to full nine, but I did make it to Indonesia and Vietnam. But uh, uh, the, trip to, the trip to Jakarta was an eye-opener because it's, it is a long trip. And I was in Jakarta, and um, Indonesia and Jakarta held a special meeting, I think, since the president spent so much of his youth there, attended a grammar school just down the, just a few blocks from the uh, US ambassador's house. And I heard about so many from local executives, bank executives, about the desire to really meet the infrastructure demands and needs in Indonesia. And the desire to buy American products to complete these product projects. And if you just go to the open air markets in Jakarta, um, and you can see why, these pro why the infrastructure is so important. So much of fresh fruit in Indonesia and in Jakarta is imported. And there's no reason for it to be imported, but it's imported. The mangoes, the citrus fruits, the bananas, they're abundant on rural farms, but frequently they spoil before they can get to marketplace. So more locomotives, better air traffic control systems, a better road system, these things, things that America makes, and America makes well, are really needed to help power this economy, power the agricultural sector in Indonesia, and to make sure that it can keep growing at the rate it's been growing at. And these are particularly the kinds of projects that I see at Exxon Bank that we can finance and we can really make sure they get off the ground and get off the ground quickly. Exxon did its first work in Indonesia 60 years ago, and it was in 1950. We financed $18 million worth of infrastructure and when the republic became republic in 1950. This $18 million, which was a lot of money in 1950, uh, it helped re rehabilitate railroads and rebuild harbors. And today, I think we can see real opportunities to keep financing more of that in the next chapter of Indonesia's growth. Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world by population and the third largest democracy. And with more than 240 million people and rich natural resources and a very expanding and a very entrepreneurial middle class, there's a great opportunity here. Uh, from the tripling of automobiles in Indonesia from 3 to 11 million. Um, so while we were there, we announced a $1 billion bank credit facility, particularly focused on small and medium-sized companies to help them in their purchase, provide them access to capital, access to credits, so they can buy American goods and services to participate in this expansion of infrastructure. According to when we were there, we learned that Indonesia expects to invest over $218 billion in infrastructure in the next five years. It's looking to expand public transportation, systems, ports, roads, all things that I think that we can facilitate in. And I, I'm hopeful that the $1 billion credit facility will give U.S. businesses a foothold in reach in, in trying to sell into that $218 billion demand for services. So going forward, we see a lot of opportunities there, particularly also in the power sector and particularly in the geothermal area. Probably one of the few places in the world that geothermal will play a major role in, in generating power supply uh, in the world. After Indonesia, I traveled to Vietnam, a country, as you all know, with about 85 million people. I met with the prime minister there. And we talked about, we talked about many things. We talked about aircraft, we talked about airports, ports, roads many things to help Vietnam grow as a country. Uh, and one of the things I thought was interesting, we, we spent more time, and I don't think I spent as much time with any world leader, talking about small and medium-sized companies, how the work that we're doing can help Vietnam also develop its SME sector. And we talked about how to make mutually beneficial progress on trade between our two countries. And Vietnam is entering from what we could see is a new phase of economic uh, activity. As its economy is growing, Vietnam is actually has more credit options, more banking options than it had before. 
And so for the first time in a long time, it's looking towards export credit agencies and commercial banks to finance its infrastructure and its businesses. And I think that we at Exim Bank are well positioned to be a part of that. One thing I also found in Vietnam is that there was a great desire to purchase U.S. goods and services. And we can provide those kind of guarantees and insurance to make, to make it easier for Vietnamese companies to buy from us. So in Vietnam, we announced a $500 million credit facility, particularly on high-priority infrastructure projects. And, it, and as part of that, we are looking at intelligent road systems, uh, more for satellite and communications, and a number of projects that Vietnam is looking to add as it builds its infrastructure. So it's not just that Vietnam and Indonesia are important to the United States. There are others, obviously, in the region. I mean, we've done substantial business in, in Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, has also seen significant growth and opportunities. And in addition to, uh, I mentioned Lion Air at the start, you know, we have been providing and helping to sell uh, with uh, our, our friends at Boeing uh, to Thai Airlines, Malaysian, Garuda, Singapore, and Philippine Airlines as well. So we have a large presence and a bullish presence uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Now, about three weeks after I joined the bank, the president lifted the ban on uh, our ability to do business in Laos and Cambodia. It was not a cause and effect, but it was, it was a nice welcome when I got to the bank. So we are looking to do business in Cambodia. We are looking to do business in Laos. These are countries that we have been off limits for over 30 years at Exim Bank, and those are some that are also I'm hoping that we can increase. So I, th I see a great deal of uh, opportunities for us in the entire region. Um, I mentioned aircraft, helicopters for offshore oil uh, exploration, um, and power and a number of the other projects. I, I see this as an area. Um, locomotives, as I also mentioned, is a very strong area and, and critical in, in Indonesia. So I believe that, um, that American products, American services, American capital goods can play a really key role in helping communities throughout Southeast Asia build their infrastructure and, and be able to keep their economies growing at the rapid rate it's been growing at. And we are working closely with the Commerce Department, who we work with on the ground in each of those countries, uh, Ron Kirk, the United States Trade Representative, and the entire commercial service, trying to give companies more access to these important markets. So I'd like to close with just one point before I take some questions. And I'd like to talk to you about why this work is important and why it's important, in my view, beyond just the exchange of goods and services. Because I think it goes beyond just monetary transactions. I think it goes to kind of laying the groundwork for commercial diplomacy. I think it's clear what, company, what countries build and what nations build reflects what they value. It reflects their goals, reflects their hopes and aspirations, and it reflects their vision for their country's future and embodies what their citizens are dreaming about, what their citizens want to achieve. And whether it's roads or rail or solar energy or airplanes, if we build things together, if we do these projects together, we will have ties that are far deeper than just the transaction itself. Because what we're really doing is we're investing in each other's people and their prosperity and their economic vitality. And these investments, yes, they're part about stronger business engagement, but I think they also will reinforce mutual respect and commitment that bet between the United States and Southeast Asia. I think it helps the United States and helps this country build on tolerance, build on respect for human rights, build on a sense of diversity, and build on expanding economic opportunities for citizens on both sides of the transaction, both on the countries we're exporting to in terms of the jobs and opportunities there and in the United States. And I think it talks about shared commitment, and it talks about building more durable democracies in each of those countries. And I think that this kind of trade between us can also help America as it tries to advance our relations in the Muslim world. And I think that's why this is a particularly important um, to the United States government as a whole. And, but it, and it, it frankly requires more conversations like we're going to have today. 
It requires more cultural exchanges. It requires more student programs to expand understanding so students in both countries have a better understanding. It's clear when I'm traveling, when, when I'm in Indonesia and Vietnam and there are people who have studied in America, it brings that understanding to their work there and it does change the dynamic and change the interaction between our two countries. Um, what's important is make sure we have a level playing field for American companies so when they compete, that they can compete fairly and evenly. And it requires um, uh, someone I admire enormously, Jeff Immel of GE likes to say, it's understanding the nuances of foreign markets. And I think the better we understand them, we can build not just business relationships, we can build trust, we can build understanding, we can build a greater knowledge about each other. And I think that it helps us really bridge some differences and, and paper over things, or not, not paper, and smooth over things when we hit a rough patch. And I think it lets us find areas of agreement, find areas of common ground uh, between both of our countries. So I think these partnerships are critical. I think this type of commercial diplomacy guides very much what I'm trying to do at the Expert Info Bank and remains our focus in the months and years ahead. So I look forward to working closely with Ernie and the Center um, and uh, expanding our work in Southeast Asia. And I want to thank you for this opportunity. And we can open up for questions wherever you want to handle it. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, yeah, you, want to just, stand. you want to, what do you prefer? Whatever you want. You're in charge. Why don't you stay at the podium right so you here. can see. Uh, when people want to sit, yeah. there's some seats yeah, please, here. I was going to say, come on up and, uh, and join us up front. Um, the, we'd love to take some questions now. This is usually the, the, a, a very interesting part of the Banyan Tree uh, Forum. Uh, the only rules are uh, just please let us know who you are and what organization you're with. And uh, I'll throw the floor open for, for questions. Start with Rich. Chairman uh, Hopper, Rich Harold with GE Transportation. First of all, First of all, thank you so much for your leadership and leadership of your great staff in helping to make American business maintain its, its competitiveness in the world. And I want to ask you a question about that today, please. Particularly related to China, which is timely since uh, President Hu Jintao is, is uh, going to be visiting us in, in about a week in Washington. Um, with the rise of China uh, has come a lot of opportunity, but also a lot of competition. And China uh, produces very often uh, uh, exports that are not only lower cost, at least at for initial price, than American companies, but China provides export financing that often amounts to um, subsidies. Uh, and uh, Jim Alden, Lorenzo Simonelli, and my colleagues and I are particularly grateful for uh, Exim stepping up to the plate and boldly meeting that Chinese competition with us in Pakistan. But what I'd like to ask you is going forward, what are the tools Exim has uh, in the coming months and years that you think are most useful to help American companies? And what are the prospects for keeping those uh, fully funded so that you have the war chest available to do it? Um, well, the comment that uh, is referred to, we have an ability. Um, I believe American products, American companies are selling what the world wants to buy and what the world is looking to buy. And that with a level playing field, American companies can compete and effectively certainly win their fair share of, not going to win every order, but certainly win their fair share of orders and tenders. Um, uh, China has not been a member of the OECD and uh, provides financing that is sort of not in compliance with OECD regulations. Um, and we have an ability, and we went and petitioned the OECD back in, uh, not petitioned, I should say, we informed the OECD back in February that there was a non-compliant financing um, on the table, and we were going to meet that financing. And we have met that, and we're hopeful that, uh, that with that level playing field on financing, that the products, which is the essence of it, American-made locomotives and Chinese locomotives can compete on a product-to-product -product basis and on value and, and that the financing is not the issue that induces the sale. Um, we have an ability to do that. Uh, we are also, I think, we are also up for reauthorization this year. So uh, one of the things we'll be looking at keenly is that we can provide the services both to large companies and small companies. And I think that um, we are self-funding 
And I would say one of the, the challenges we have ahead and, and as we begin 2011 and we go through our reauthorization is we're one of the very few agencies that is totally self-funding. The fees that our customers pay, pay for all our administrative costs, as I mentioned, and all of our loan losses. And I think that that's, that's a message and that's a uh, we're trying to make as many people both in the business community and the communications and on the Hill understand because I think that changes the dynamic. We're not just looking for another appropriation as other agencies are. And we're creating jobs, so I'm hopeful that as we go through this reauthorization process, we're able to sort of make those points clear and therefore stand out a little bit from some of the other issues that are going on. I think that's where you're coming from, am I got? Hi, uh, Matt Schuel from Inside U.S. Trade. Uh, thanks, Chairman Hochberg. Uh, I actually have a question related to uh, the reauthorization that you mentioned. It's important to, I know, both the XM and the business community. Uh, the business community has outlined some of the issues it wants to see addressed in that context, um, such as, as you mentioned, how to continue expanding XM financing to small businesses with limited administrative resources, uh, leveling the playing field with other ECAs, um, by relaxing the 85% U.S. content requirement and also, uh, from what I understand, this whole issue of tied aid, uh, which I think is, is what the gentleman was referring to uh, with China. Has, uh, have you at the XM and the administration set out your priorities for the charter reauthorization? Um, have you had any interagency meetings about that and how receptive are you to those priorities outlined by the business community, uh, such as the U.S. Uh, relaxing the content requirement. Thanks. That sounds like six questions. Uh, <laughs> we're in the process of going through reauthorization. Uh, we're doing it internally. We then uh, are about to embark on an interagency process with OMB. Um, some of the issues you mentioned are actually nothing, are not charter issues. So uh, one thing I've learned is I'm going to focus on the charter. I'm not going to, I'm not going to drag things that are not in the charter into the charter and vice versa. So a number of those things are not. Uh, content requirements, for example, are not charter issues. Um, uh, tide aid is really not a charter issue. Um, small business is an important uh, initiative of the president. I believe one of the reasons the president asked me to take this job having worked in a small, uh, was once a small business for 20 years and then at the SBA under President Clinton, we have a large emphasis on small business. We're actually announcing a partnership called Global Access for Small Business on Thursday with uh, Tom Donahue, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and National Association of Manufacturers will be doing that at the Chamber. So our work in small business is important um, uh, and that's really an appropriation issue. and. Uh, since we're on a CR that's made our expansion and reaching more small businesses uh, much more of a challenge for us because uh, the president asked for a 25% increase in our budget so we could do that. And since we're on a CR, we're, we're at last year's level. So that's made our work in small business much, much more challenging. Um, uh, I think I'll only I'll, I'll comment on one. I mean, on you mentioned about 85% content. Uh, I'm really not a big advocate of, of working to change that. I think that, that there are a lot of advocates on both sides of that issue. It does help a number of American, a lo number of American suppliers uh, in terms of supplying U.S. exporters. Um, it is higher than, than most of our trading partners, but um, I think if we focus on small business, if we focus on these nine countries, if we focus on working with companies large and small and finding innovative financing and finding other ways of getting our products out there, we can double exports. And I'm not sure the 85% is really going to make that difference. Okay, but what are the priorities then for the charter? I mean, the, sorry to interrupt, but you said some of those issues weren't related to the charter, so kind of what are Well, I'm, uh, m mostly making sure we have the, uh, uh, right now the bank is capped at $100 billion in our portfolio. Our portfolio is about $78 billion, so we're running the numbers right now to make sh find out how much headroom we need so we're able to both double exports and have sufficient uh, lending authority to do so. That's one of the, the larger issues we're looking at. Um, and most of the others, we are working again internally, and uh, I know, uh, where did I see John Hardy? 
we're going to be meeting with CEE and a number of our other business community, and so we're also soliciting comments in terms of from business community, what, what else is needed in that regard. Um, so that's really how we're, we're looking at those issues. Okay. For the gentleman in the back and then the gentleman up here. Thank you. Bob DeHaan from the National Fisheries Institute. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, um, I was struck by how, um, by your language in reference to Vietnam and Indonesia in terms of the mutuality of the relationship and the, and the need for making mutually beneficial progress. Um, there are two um, issues related to the same um, fish that's being uh, processed and farmed in Vietnam that I think um, have the potential to create one of the rough patches that you uh, referred to. The, the fish is called Pangasius, um, and there are two issues there. The first is that the USDA is considering a regulation that would redefine what this species is and um, um, in effect would bar its importation into the United States. <clears throat> Pardon me. And the second is a uh, Commerce Department determination uh, of last fall that would impose a 130% duty on the importation of the same fish um, under our anti-dumping regime. Um, from our perspective, and I'm certain from the perspective of our friends um, from Hanoi who are here today, that's an unjustified decision. Um, given the excellent outreach that the administration has shown in this region of the world, um, in, in economic matters especially, over the past two years, I wonder if you'd like to comment on those decisions um, and indicate where you think, from an Exim perspective, uh, they ought to come down. Thanks. Um, I probably won't comment because we actually, those are just sort of, they're out of our lane. What, you know, what we do at the Exim Bank is finance U.S. exports. So I'm kind of put all of my time focused on how I can help more U.S. exporters, be they products or services, export their sales over, products overseas, their services overseas, and that's my focus. So when it comes to, uh, I, I, and I'm unaware, I, I mean, I'm generally aware of some of these issues, but not the specifics you mentioned. And uh, I think I'm probably better off leaving that to USDA and Secretary Vilsack and Locke to help sort that one out. Uh, Justin Guay, Sierra Club. Uh, so Exim Bank has a congressional mandate to use 10% of its portfolio towards clean technology and environmentally ben beneficial exports. Uh, but according to a recent GAO report, the Exim Bank has uh, spent a mere 0.23% over the period of 2003 through 2010 on clean technology exports. Um, at the same time, fossil fuel technology uh, exports have been skyrocketing. Uh, so to put it in perspective, in 2010, Exim lent for the Sasan coal plant in India, which was $917 million, or roughly four times the amount that Exim spent on renewable technology for you know, seven years. Um, and I'm wondering how Exim plans to reverse this situation and uh, impr improve American competitiveness in an emerging sector and at the same time uh, move away or shift away from funding fossil fuel projects uh, that shackle dynamic and emerging economies with uh, outdated technologies? Great question. Um, just a, a couple of comments on the numbers. First of all, uh, last year, the year that ended three months ago, we did about $330 million of renewable exports. Uh, that was up over threefold of the year before and over 300-fold of about four years ago. So it's not enough. We haven't done nearly enough, but um, I'm, I'm proud of, of more than tripling the prior year. We currently are we are currently financing about 15 percent of American renewable exports, and America exports about two billion dollars of renewable energy. We did about 15 percent of that. It's probably a higher impact on renewable energy in terms of our footprint there than almost any other area of, of exports. Um, in the areas of fossil fuel, um, we would like to see that go down as well. Uh, we put in a carbon policy. We put in a much more rigorous approach to how we approve those projects. And one of the things I'm trying to do, and I could use your help on, is we are trying to recruit other export credit agencies to adopt policies like we do. Uh, what we can't do is, is not do any exports in the United States and let Germany and France and, and other countries and China and others supply all those coal plants and supply all the coal technologies while we sit back. So what I'm trying to do and we have a meeting scheduled in February is to make sure that other export credit agencies 
play by the same rules that we do, that they record the carbon footprint, they actually have a policy about how they will finance those things so we can do this globally. Uh, I would like to do more on renewable. Uh, I'm working to try and increase that. Uh, I'd like it to be faster. I'd like it to be faster, but partly I'm also trying to, and I've, I actually have had greater uh, um, agreement by starting with the G7 of export credit agents to get more of them on the same page as we are. So I think we're making progress. I wish it was faster. I'm Guan Yunli from 21st Century Business Herald, the leading financial daily in China. Uh, actually, the, uh, the chairman has talked a, a lot about the competitiveness of United companies in Southeast Asia uh, in your speech. Actually, I think uh, uh, when, you talk, when you are talking about the competitiveness, you should be very clear about, about who is your major competitors, and then compare your, uh, your compare your disadvantages and ad advantages with your competitors. So my first question is that, in your opinion, who is the U.S. company's major competitors in the Southeast Asia? Uh, will, will it be the European Union or the countries like China, India, or Japan in that region? My second question is, uh, is that uh, uh, you did quite a great job in the past year to help the United States, uh, U.S. companies. So what will you do in the future to improve the U.S. company's competitiveness in Southeast Asia? Uh, will you get much more capital to support them, or will you uh, introduce some new uh, facilities to help them? Okay, that's my okay. question. Uh, I would say uh, in Southeast Asia, we see a lot of competition uh, from uh, Japan, uh, China, India, uh, Germany, uh, Korea. Those are, the, those are um, some of the competition we see. I would say that um, one of the things I would like to encourage more American companies to do is to get out there and compete. Frequently when I'm in foreign countries, I'm just hearing repeatedly that there's just not enough American companies actually making a bid and, uh, and responding to a tender offer. So that's one of the issues that uh, I'm hopeful from this forum and other forums that we can get more American companies to go out there and be more competitive. Um, one of the new products we're doing, we launched this past fall uh, to help American companies be more competitive is we've, we're now doing something called supply chain financing so that if we have an exporter, we can help provide uh, export credit assistance to the suppliers of exporters, the indirect exporters. So that's another way of helping U.S. companies be more competitive. Mostly, I believe that if we, if we have a level playing field on bidding, a level playing field on tariffs, uh, a level playing field on taxes, and financing, American companies can compete well. It's just harder for them to compete when the playing field is just not level. Uh, Greg? Greg Dole with Boeing. As one of the uh, Boeing representatives in the room, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the fact that the chairman and his staff worked tirelessly over the last few years to keep uh, some of those foreign carriers, including uh, Lion Air and uh, Vietnam Airlines, uh, flying through uh, those facilities that they have provided at the bank. Um, you can also rest assured that um, the Boeing company, John Hardy at CEE and others, will be up on Capitol Hill apprising John Boehner and the rest of uh, the Congress the Tea Party, among others, <laughs> that uh, in fact you are a profit center, a $5 billion profit center. And what's not really known that well, and we've got to do a better job, is just um, how much uh, these uh, sales impact not only the Boeing Company, it's 160,000 employees, but the 22,000 suppliers in every state of the union. I mean, it's absolutely critical that the Congress understand that and as well, that 12 million U.S. jobs are touched by the aviation sector. 12 million jobs. So thank you. Thank you uh, for your staff's support over the years. I'm waiting for a question. Years. Anybody? Did I, did I hear, can you hear a question there? You have to enforce the question. Yeah, got to enforce the question rule. <laughs> this was uh, a, a, not a paid political <laughs> announcement. 
But we do appreciate, again, everything you've done for us and uh, the administration in helping us sell aircraft uh, around the globe and to level the playing field with our competitors. So it's just a thank you. Thank um, you. Appreciate your help. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm Jim, a reporter from Singapore. I'd like to re-ask that question about China in perhaps more direct terms. Um, I was wondering if you could give us your assessment of America's combat economic competitiveness in Southeast Asia relative to what um, China is doing. Um, in your view, uh, what is America continuing to do right and well? What areas are lagging in your view? In five to ten years' time, you know, do you expect to see a serious shift in, in the economic balance of things? And if, if I may just tag on one real quick question. The nine countries that you listed, I'm not sure if I heard wrong, but I don't think China was listed in there. Um, why is that? Thank you. Okay. Let me see if I can get all that. Uh, I'm going to start with the last one because I, I can remember it best. Uh, China is not listed. Um, it is an important market. It's the third largest destination for U.S. goods and services. It's just that our, our financing is not really a factor in making sales to China that uh, I, the nine countries we've chosen are nine countries where, in addition to all those other factors, our financing can make the competitive difference between making a sale and not making a sale. That's just simply not the case in China. I, I think what's most, I mean, China is a formidable competitor. Uh, China is, you know, both a developing country and an industrial powerhouse and competes strongly with American companies. Um, I still, I'm very bullish on U.S. exports. American companies make some of the best products in the world. They make some of the most reliable products. They make products that, that their companies stand behind. Um, foreign buyers tell me this. When they, you know, when an American company says they're going to deliver, they deliver on time. They back up their products with service. And there's a there's in very key, there's a transparency in doing business with us. There's a transparency in doing business with American companies that lets buyers know exactly where they stand. Those values, those products, that approach to business serves American business owners and leaders very well. What we stand to do is to make sure that financing is never a stumbling block, that financing never gets in the way from an American company making a sale. That's, what, that's my commitment. I can, I can respond on the financing side. And if there are, com if there are countries that provide below market or sort of non-compliant financing, we will find a way to meet that so that that is not the reason com American company loses its sales. The last piece I still emphasize is we need to get more American companies out there bidding, more American companies with working with Exim Bank, working with the Commerce Department, working with the USTR so that they can, they're out there and competing and know that if they do compete, we will back them up with financing, we'll back them up with making sure trade uh, regulations and rules are followed, and in providing the access and intelligence on the marketplace.